All right. Um, welcome back, everybody, to the Dharma Doors. I'm Michael Charles Owens, and you're in the San Francisco Dharma Collective. Um, and tonight is a special night because we're concluding our year-long study of the Manjushri's Buddha Lan Array of Virtues. <laughs> Uh, so that's what we're going to be doing tonight, and I think I mentioned this last week that I basically plan to kind of summarize the sutra, because we've been moving through it so slowly, one Sunday Dharma doors at a time, um, <clears throat> we sort of lose, we lose track of exactly <laughs> what this sutra is about, and so I want to do that, but I want to start at the end. So, um, so last week's Dharma Doors, I gave uh, kind of the whole night was dedicated to discussing the topic of Samadhi. And that was all because at the end of this sutra, it mentions <clears throat> that after basically the sutra had concluded, it mentions that Manjushri, the, the star of the sutra, it says then Manjushri immediately entered the samadhi of the bodhisattvas emitting lights to reveal all dharmas are illusory. <laughs> Like that was the samadhi. And that's what prompted me to sort of start talking about samadhis last week. And I didn't actually get back to the sutra last week. And so I didn't really get to finish some thoughts that I had, which was what, what's this samadhi all about? Because there's a way that you know, I've, I've done so many Dharma talks about dhyana and samadhi that there's a way in which I feel like we're all familiar with the four jhanas and the four formless jhanas, those samadhis. So the samadhi of infinite space, infinite consciousness, infinite nothingness, neither perception nor non-perception. So there's a way that we're used to those. And then last week, I even introduced this idea of the samadhi of skateboarding to, to broaden our thinking, to broaden our understanding of what could a samadhi be? Could, could there be such a thing as the samadhi of skateboarding? But all of that, all of that discussion of traditional meditative samadhis, and even this idea of a samadhi of skateboarding, all of that was then to bring us back to what is this? What is the samadhi of the bodhisattvas emitting lights to reveal all dharmas are illusory? So there's, of course, a number of different ways that we could think of that or conceive of that. Because I have a lot to cover tonight, I'm going to just jump right to my point. This whole sutra that we've been reading now for a year, if there's one through line, if there's one idea that just keeps getting repeated, it's about the illusory nature of all dharmas. And so it might be that this samadhi of the bodhisattvas emitting lights to reveal all dharmas are illusory, it might have something to do with this sutra, meaning it might even be this sutra. And so what I'm going to suggest this evening that we kind of think about is, well, sort of basically thinking about the act of reading or even the act of listening to a story, listening to a like a sutra like this, 
it could be that they're talking about a kind of meditative state that one gets into when one is imagining these things that I will describe in more detail this evening, but that I've been describing now every Sunday night. So all of these ideas, it could be that they're talking about engaging with these ideas in that way. And that's another reason why I wanted to kind of summarize the whole sutra tonight, because if the samadhi is the sutra that reveals all dharmas are illusory, then it might be nice to sort of just cover that whole samadhi in that way. So, and I'll have more to say about that last part in, in uh, probably about, about an hour or so, but let's go back to the beginning. I want to sort of just go walk you through the basics of this sutra. It's a beautiful sutra now that I've really kind of studied it and more or less kind of translated it. I'm still working on my uh, translation. But the sutra starts classic sutra fashion, you know, thus have I heard. Oh, by the way, tonight, for the rest of tonight, um, I have plan to I have plans to read certain sections, and I will be reading from the Tibetan version that is online at 84,000.read. So I've decided just to use that for consistency's sake tonight. So the sutra starts like any other sutra, right? Thus have I heard. One time the world honored one, the Buddha was residing at on Mount Gridrakuta, the vulture's peak, in the city of Rajgriha, with a great Sangha of monks and bodhisattvas, including Maitreya, Manjushri, uh, uh, Avilokiteshvara, Mahastama Prapta, and many others. And then what happens in the opening is that the Buddha decides, I'm going to go into the city of Rajgriha. And it's at that time that the first of many miracles happen. And the miracle that happens is that wherever the Buddha steps as he's starting to head into the city, these giant lotus flowers pop up from the ground, the size of wagon wheels, it says, with bodhisattvas seated on these giant lotus flowers, and they go flying around and circulating above the great city of Rajgriha, and they are reciting or chanting or singing praises of the Buddha. And so the opening are these bodhisattvas circling around Rajgriha, talking about the Buddha's coming, the Buddha's coming, the Buddha's coming to town. And that's sort of the end of the introduction. And then that leads to the next section, which is about a bodhisattva who's living in uh, Rajgriha, in the capital city. His, he's called destroyer of virtue. I think that's what they call him here. Yeah, destroyer of non, you know, the non-virtuous or destroyer of vice. I'm sorry, not destroyer of virtue, destroyer of the non-virtuous. And he's described as a householder bodhisattva. And the destroyer of vice, destroyer of the non-virtuous, sees and hears these bodhisattvas announcing that the Buddha's coming. And so this bodhisattva goes running to ask the Buddha a question. And the question is on paragraph 135, 1.35. And So the Bodhisattva's question, I'm going to paraphrase the question. It's a very simple question. It's, 
how do bodhisattvas attain anuttara samyak sambodhi, thus purifying their Buddha land and adorning it with arrays of virtues? Simple question. How do bodhisattvas attain anuttara samyak sambodhi, purifying their Buddha land and adorning it with arrays of virtues? And to the bodhisattva, the householder bodhisattva living in the city, living in Rajgriha, the Buddha says, if bodhisattvas have just one quality, just one dharma, they will swiftly and fully awaken to Anuttara Samyak Sambodhi, purify their Buddha realms, and acquire the arrays of virtues for their Buddha realms just as they desire. What is that one dharma? What is that one quality? It is for bodhisattvas to develop the mind that is set upon attaining anuttara samyak sambodhi out of compassion and pure motivation toward all sentient beings. So. In, and this is still the Buddha talking, in this context, what does pure motivation mean? What is that pure motivation to be mastered? Pure motivation is arousing the mind set upon awakening and avoiding everything that isn't virtuous. What is to be avoided? What is not virtuous? It is attachment, aggression, ignorance, and craving for the features of the household life. Renouncing those, attachment, aggression, ignorance, and craving, and the features of the household life. Renouncing those things, bodhisattvas have no desire for gain, honor, or praise and they abide in the accomplishment of going forth. What's the accomplishment of going forth? It's realizing all phenomena, all dharmas, just as they are. What is realizing all phenomena just as they are? All phenomena refers to the five aggregates, sense elements and sense sources, as well as conditioned and unconditioned phenomena. How are the five aggregates to be understood? They are understood to be illusory, empty, unobservable, unborn, and unceasing. They are understood in this way to the, degree, to the degree that one does not see them as being real. When there is no seeing things as being real, no knowing, no assuming, when there is no thinking and no conceptualizing things as real, all concepts are pacified. And this is what is called understanding the aggregates. Understanding the aggregates is understanding all phenomena. And this is the accomplishment of going forth. Okay, so there's, there's a little more to it after that, of course, but that's the main gist of it. And what I was, you know, hoping you heard, what I was hoping, I, you know, I emphasized is that it all kind of boils down to this idea of all dharmas or all phenomena being illusory, empty in that way. But that's the teaching that the Buddha gives to the householder bodhisattva living in the city. So give up attachment, aggression, hypocrisy, craving, and understand that the aggregates are illusory or empty. That's the, that's the quality, that's the practice. 
then the Buddha leaves, but he's still in the city of Rajgriha. And then he goes to see Ajata Shatru, the king. He goes to see King Ajata Shatru. And he has another little quick Dharma talk with King Ajata Shatru. And King Ajata Shatru has a few more questions, which are basically what's the origin? What are the cause of attachment? aggression and delusion or ignorance, the three poisons. And ultimately he asks, and let me see if I can find this. This is at paragraph 1.50. So yeah, the King Ajatushatru's question to the Buddha is, blessed one, where do malice, anger, aggression, and hypocrisy arise from? From whence is ignorance unknowing? From whence is it born? And how does it cease? And the Buddha then says to Ajata Shatru, Your Majesty, malice, anger, aggression, and hypocrisy arise from clinging to self and clinging to possessions. When in a state of self-clinging and possessiveness, one cannot recognize positive qualities or flaws. This is what is called not knowing, ignorance. However, with respect to a person who fully understands self-clinging and possessiveness just as they are, one can't speak of knowing or not knowing. And I'm going to pause there because we could be here all night at this rate. But so that's a little Dharma talk. And that's just part of the Dharma talk that the Buddha gives to Ajata Shatru. And we notice that it's about some of the same themes in terms of attachment, aggression, but we're given a little more details about the source of those things in terms of the source of those are self and clinging to possessions. But then after the Buddha gives this Dharma talk, King Ajatashatra is delighted, and then the Buddha leaves, and he goes up, back up, to the top of the vulture's peak of Gridrakuta. And there, there's a bunch of bodhisattvas and a bunch of voice hearers and a you know, bunch of people. And Shariputra steps up with a question. And now Shariputra, of course, is one of those monks, one of those shravakas of a voice hearer. And it's interesting because what Shariputra asks the Buddha, he basically says, when you were in the city, you gave a teaching to the Bodhisattva destroyer of vice. You gave a teaching about achieving Anuttara Samyak Sambodhi, purifying one's Buddha land and adorning it with the rays of virtues. Could you maybe say a little more about that? is basically what Shariputra says. He asks for the Buddha to give another teaching on the same topic. And now this is funny or interesting because you might know, of course, that Shariputra is this really interesting character in Buddhist sutras. You might know that Shariputra is very associated with the Abhidharma, and the Abhidharma, that kind of classification of Buddhist teachings, the Abhidharma, it's all the lists. You know how the Buddha teaches in these lists? Well, the lists are considered like summaries. They're considered like these more detailed explanations of the Dharma that the Buddha teaches in the sutras. And Basically, the origin of the Abhidharma, or like the traditional origin of the Abhidharma, 
it's all from Shariputra asking the Buddha, hey, could you say a little more about that? And the idea is that the Buddha had already given a teaching, had already given the sutras, but Shariputra kind of wants to know a little more. And so the Buddha starts to give Shariputra all of these lists, which are again, summaries and ways of sort of organizing all the teachings. So it's kind of funny that in this sutra, it's actually, it's, it's, a, it's a really interesting event. What happens is, is that Shariputra says to the Buddha, hey, could you say a little more about this array of virtues idea? And the Buddha's like, yeah. And a couple of things happen. The first thing that happens is, is that the Buddha asks Maitreya, Bodhisattva, will you, will you prepare my seat, get my seat ready for me to sit down and then I'll, I'll give this teaching. And the sutra talks about how everybody, I think it's my, maybe even Maitreya, who's like, whoa, why is the Buddha asking me to get his seat together? Isn't that like Ananda's job? Isn't that like one of the Shravaka's jobs? And the sutra basically says, oh, no. Maitreya was asked to prepare the Buddha's seat because the Buddha is about to give a bodhisattva teaching. He's not going to give a teaching to the Shravaka's, which is kind of what we're, we're to understand kind of is what happened in the city is that the Buddha gave like a teaching for householders, gave kind of like the, the general answer, but now he's going to give a deeper answer. And so there's this whole performance where Maitreya rather than Ananda sets out the Buddha's seat. But then the Buddha says, it's not beautiful enough yet here. And so, and let me see, let me maybe read this. This is a uh, paragraph 1.55. Then the blessed one thought, this setting is not beautiful enough for me to give such a Dharma teaching. Therefore, I shall perform a miracle whereby I will em emit trillions of light rays in each of the 10 directions. Each light ray will then illuminate trillions of Buddha lands. The sun and the moon in those Buddha lands will become invisible, eclipsed by this light, and they will no longer appear to the human eye. Likewise, the God's lights will no longer be visible, nor will the lights of Nagas, Yakshas, jewels, lightning, fire, stars, or any other being. In countless limitless worlds throughout the 10 directions, this light will instantly illuminate all mountain ranges, as well as all buildings, forests, and jungles. And then the Buddha <laughs> emits this light and it's accompanied by him speaking in a clear voice. And then this really interesting thing happens. After the Buddha emits these lights in the 10 directions, we start to hear from the sutra about these world systems. It starts in the east. And it says that, you know, way far that way, I mean, really far that way, there's a whole other world. You could think of it maybe as a whole other planet, if you would like, but it's a whole other world in the eastern direction. And what it talks about is a bodhisattva in that world who sees this light and hears this clear voice and wants to know where it came from. And so that bodhisattva goes and asks the Buddha that lives in that world in the eastern direction. And that Buddha tells that bodhisattva, oh, west of here, 
a, a bunch, a bunch, a bunch, a bunch of world systems that way, there's a world called Saha, endurance, where there's a Buddha called Shakyamuni, who's gathered around with a bunch of Shravakas and a bunch of Bodhisattvas, and he's about to give a teaching. And that's why he's put out this light. And then that Bodhisattva, along with other Bodhisattvas from that world, they get the idea that they want to go to the Saha world to hear the Buddha give this teaching. And this happens in a world to the east, in a world to the west, the south, the north, the intermediate directions, the zenith, and the nadir. Now, I want to share with you quickly, yeah, because we got plenty of time. Let's see, where did it go? So I'm going to jump over to uh, paragraph 1.65, if you're following along. So was it this one? No, it wasn't that one. Sorry about that. Where did you go? Oh, so. Sorry about that. So I'm actually over on paragraph 1.94. And I mean, I guess I, I, at this point, I should maybe summarize it. Well, basically, the Buddha there, yeah, because it's a little long, so I'll, I'll, I'll basically summarize it. But in the, where are we at? Well, I forget which direction we're in, but in a, one of these world systems, the basic idea is, is that the bodhisattva in this other world system sees the light, hears the Buddha's voice, and goes and asks, what's going on? Where's this light coming from? And that Buddha tells the bodhisattva about Shakyamuni and about how even, even when evil people lie about the, the Buddha Shakyamuni, that Buddha that blessed one remains compassionately patient, <clears throat> accepting all. The same applies to those who are filled with hate and rage, who are sinking into hell realms, who make the lower realms their domain, and who fail to respect the Buddha, the Dharma, and the Sangha, as well as all the lesser lower beings who delight in jealousy and who ridicule and slander the blessed one doing him harm by insulting him with a mind that is broad as the earth shakyamuni buddha is without attachment or anger thus even when people honor him he doesn't become self-important and if they fail to honor him it does not bother him the slightest even if people ridicule and scold him he does not think about it or conceptualize it, and he remains completely unfazed. He doesn't become disturbed or agitated or saddened by any of it. Therefore, that world is called endurance, saha. And the bodhisattva that asked about the world saha says, Ooh, ooh, oh, you blessed one. I'm very fortunate that I wasn't born in the Saha world among such degenerate beings that would disgrace the Buddha so. Hey, that's when the Buddha in that world says, whoa, kid, you shouldn't say such things as that. Why not? I'll tell you why. In the northeastern direction from here, there's a world called a thousandfold adornments. 
in that Buddha realm, the Tathagata, the Arhat, the perfectly enlightened Buddha, King Maheshvara, is still present, still alive and well. The beings in that Buddha realm are all extremely happy. The happiness of those beings is analogous to the bliss experienced by a meditator absorbed in samadhi. Noble one, compared to the or compared to spending billions of years practicing pure conduct in that world, thousandfold adornments, you would generate far greater merit by arousing just for a minute a loving attitude towards all those beings in the Saha world. That being so, what need we say of living in the Saha world purely day and night? And that's when the Bodhisattva said, world honored one, I'm going to the Saha world. And a bunch of other bodhisattvas want to tag along with him. So I wanted to kind of go back over this beautiful section where this light goes to all of these different world systems. And these bodhisattvas then start flocking from the 10 directions to the Saha world, to endurance. And this is what is this this particular kind of um i don't know what you would call this but this narrative device of having these other worlds is um it is uh, indicative it is very much a part of what are called pure land sutras and the idea here and i want to kind of go back for a minute the idea begins with that bodhisattva destroyer of vice, destroyer of the non-virtuous. And that bodhisattva's question sets the tone for this whole sutra. The tone is about how do bodhisattvas purify their Buddha land? How do they adorn their Buddha land? with arrays of virtues? How do they quickly attain Anuttara Samyak Sambodhi? And the idea, of course, is that someone like destroyer of vice bodhisattva, who is interested in a pure land, wants to purify their Buddha land, the assumption then is that bodhisattva should destroy our vice? The, the assumption is then that then they're not living in a purified realm yet. <laughs> so that's the idea. Is if they're if the bodhisattva is asking, how do I purify my Buddha land? It's safe to assume they're not living in a pure land yet. In other words, this sucks. <laughs> when does this get better? <laughs> When is the when is my Buddha land going to be purified? And so this interesting thing that happens where we are now told about these other worlds, but those people from the other worlds, they want to come to this world and uh, not and they they live in pure lands. Like they, and like he said, there's a world over there. You could go over there. It's beautiful all the time. Excuse me. Mm. <clears throat> and just like that Bodhisattva, that's like, whoa, I'm so, I'm so glad I wasn't born in the Saha world. After this conversation with that Buddha, that Bodhisattva is starting to rethink the Saha world. And I would suggest that that is where we're supposed to be in terms of the sutra, starting to rethink this world that we live in, in that way. And so after the bodhisattvas from the 10 directions all arrive, 
Now it's beautiful enough for the Buddha to give the answer to Shariputra. And that's exactly what the Buddha proceeds to do. Now, what the Buddha does is he unloads a bunch of lists. <laughs> and this is a very long section of the sutra. I'm not even going to read from it. I'm not going to go into it. But it's a bunch of lists about qualities of bodhisattvas. Sometimes the list, there, there's four things. Sometimes there's five things, six things, seven things, eight things. And the lists go on and on. And I think the most important aspect of that section of the sutra is that the idea of adorning one's Buddha land, that's the theme of the sutra, the idea of purifying and adorning one's Buddha land. And if you're paying attention, what you realize is that the section that's given to Shariputra, all of those qualities, all of those lists of qualities of the Bodhisattva, those are the arrays of virtues of a Bodhisattva's pure land. And so you can start to kind of get into the poetry of these things because they are talking about a list as an array. And that's an interesting way to think of a list as a kind of uh, an array, like a display, like a bouquet, a bouquet of Dharma, if you will, right? And so Shariputra gets this kind of giant list that goes on for pages. And that sort of ends what is considered, at least in the Tibetan tradition, that ends what is considered the first half of this sutra. The second half of this sutra, and I'll pause now. Anybody have any questions, comments? Yeah, no. The final part of the sutra that you read very briefly was had lights coming out of eyes and 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 illuminating the illusory nature of stuff right and then we went back to the beginning and and when the buddha did the same thing and illuminated like world systems and what there's a connection there right <laughs> <laughs> there is a connection would you Can like you me to speak to that is? connection <laughs> <laughs> i mean i have an idea of that <laughs> yeah, I I certainly chose that particular section to read because I did want it to remind you of the samadhi at the end that's about emitting light that reveals the illusory nature of all dharmas. Um, I do think that there is, well, I but there is a connection, uh, of course, between the two. But let's now, I want to use then this moment and use Noam's great question to talk or a little bit, because I've already talked about this in one of the prior sessions, but I want to remind everybody about what they might, might be talking about in terms of this light. Now, I know it's described as light beams, tr trillions of light beams going in all these directions. And what's interesting about this particular moment, this particular miracle, is that these light beams are also kind of the voice of the Buddha, because they, they talk about it as a, this clear voice kind of being along with these light beams. And, you know, that's, of course, very interesting in the age of, uh, um, well, electrical voice communication, by which I mean a fiber optic cable that's actually light beams boop, 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 that's shooting, that is turning into a voice even right now. 
So that's interesting. But more than that, my Dharma talk in the past about the light, I always sort of like to remind everybody that there's kind of a metaphorical thing going on here with the idea of light. And what I mean is, is that, for example, the classic example, if you were in a completely dark room and you just didn't know, you didn't know if there was, if there was anything else in the room or anybody else in the room, you were just in the dark. If somebody put on a light, the light would allow you to see and then you would know what was in the room. So the light reveals what's going on. And yes, you can think about that literally as far as an actual electrical light, actual photonic light rays, light beams, and now I know what's going on. But let's say that Let's say you were trying to learn something. Let's say you were trying to fix a car engine. And you're looking at this car engine like, whoa, I don't know what's going on. You're in the dark about how to fix this engine. But if somebody came along that was knowledgeable and they told you some things, that then you were like, oh, I get it. I know how this works. You could then say that that person and the words out of their mouth, the, the wisdom, the teachings that they gave you about car engines, you could say that that wisdom, that those words brought you out of the darkness. That it brought you out of ignorance and not knowing. So just like our light brings us into a state of knowing from a state of not knowing, maybe the Buddha or the Buddhists here are describing the dispensing of wisdom and knowledge as the emission of light. It's how I think about it. I don't, you know, again, I put it all, I put all of this out here as possible interpretations, nothing obviously definitive. So going back to Noam's, Noam's kind of inquiry about the lights, I would then suggest that also in that moment when the Buddha is emitting this light, emitting this voice and calling the bodhisattvas, I would also suggest that that is sort of about the sutra itself, the words, the teachings of the sutra that are now, well, I, I you know, I, I probably should say this sooner than later, so I'll say it now, but it's at a, it's at a moment like this, specifically the moment where the bodhisattvas are coming from their respective worlds to the Saha world. It's at that moment that the sutra starts to become a little, well, I've talked about this also in, in Dharma classes, but the sutra starts to become a little recursive, as it were, meaning it's starting to sort of talk about the event of reading the sutra. And so the idea is, is that when I, right now, tonight, when I read that section about the Buddha emitting the light, it could be that the Buddha was emitting the light at that time, because the idea is that those words were headed out in that way. And insofar as all of these different wonderful bodhisattvas have now tuned in via Zoom and otherwise, there's a gathering now of bodhisattvas to hear this dharma teaching so again it's at this moment where there's a funny thing happening where we're reading this sutra but the sutra is describing the event of reading the sutra which is happening right now 
So that's fun. Okay. And then of course, within the within that multiverse of the of the Saha world, that's where the Buddha gives the teaching to Shariputra. That concludes part one. And then part two begins with this bodhisattva powerful lion's roar or, or i think in the chinese it was a uh, lion courage thundering voice so same kind of ideas slightly different translations of those two but this bodhisattva has a question or two or three about manjushri and so this again starts a new um, second half of the sutra. And the first question that the Bodhisattva, Lion Courage, Powerful Voice, the first question that they have is about how long will it be before Manjushri attains Anuttara Samyak Sambodhi. And the idea here is, is that if we're kind of thinking of the sutra as a whole, and we're kind of going back to Bodhisattva, destroyer of vice, and that original question of how can a Bodhisattva attain Anuttara Samyak Sambodhi, purify their Buddha land and adorn it with a raise of virtues. How, how can they do that? And then the Buddha says, oh, this one, one Dharma, just this one way. And then even to Shariputra, he gives more lists, but it's all about this idea of attaining Anuttara Samyak Sambodhi and purifying your Buddha land. So the question that's being posed to Manju Shri Yes, it's it's asking Manjushri, like, how long until you achieve Anuttara Samyak Sambodhi? But it's also a more broad general question about how long does it take for anybody to achieve Anuttara Samyak Sambodhi and to purify their Buddha land? Like, is this something that you could do in like a weekend retreat? Is this something that we're talking about years? Like, how long is this going to take? So the Bodhisattva, powerful, lying, courage, thundering voice, that's their first question. And Manjushri answers, let's see. Oh, so I'm jumping all the way. If you want to follow along, I'm jumping all the way to uh, one uh, paragraph, 1.182. So hmm? sure I got that right. Oh, sorry. So actually I'm back at paragraph one point one six five. Yeah, and so this starts this general question about the nature of Manjushri's awakening or enlightenment. And he basically says, so he, yeah, instead of asking, he says, Manjushri says, instead of asking me how long it's going to take, he says, you should instead ask me whether I will or not. So whether I will truly obtain Anuttar Samyak Sambodhi or not. And why? And he says, because if I truly obtain Buddhahood, I would also have, I would also have to be fully awakened. And he says, but I don't really truly awaken to anything. So how could I fully awaken to anything? 
And this is where I actually am not crazy about the Tibetan version. I like the Chinese version. But the point is, is he basically says, like, I'm not even, I'm not obtaining anything. So your question about how long it's going to take, it doesn't, it does not compute because I'm not trying to attain anything. And the, that's where the Bodhisattva says, but wait a minute. Haven't you made the Bodhisattva vow? Haven't you vowed to attain Anuttara Samyak Sambodhi for the sake of all sentient beings? That's what the Buddha told destroyer of vice in the city. So like the idea is, is that a Bodhisattva vows to attain awakening for the sake, for the benefit of all beings. So he's like, Manjushri, you're talking about not attaining an awakening, but didn't you make the vow? Haven't you vowed to attain Anuttara Samyak Sambodhi for the sake of all beings? And this is where Manjushri says, I haven't. Why not? Because sentient beings are unobservable. Basically, he's going to say they're non-existent. He says, if I observed sentient beings... I might then, as a consequence, seek and attain Anuttara Samyak Sambodhi for their sake. But noble one, because there are no sentient beings, because there is no jiva, no life force, and no pudgala, no personalities, I don't attain awakening, nor do I turn away from it? So there, once again, we have this teaching about the illusory nature of phenomena, but now it's about the illusory nature of sentient beings, the illusory nature of life, the illusory nature of a personality. And this is, of course, all teachings that represent pranya paramita. So this idea of pranya, transcendent wisdom, this idea of pranya paramita, liberation or deliverance by way of such wisdom, that pranya wisdom, and remember, Bodhisattva Manjushri is the Bodhisattva of pranya wisdom. And that pranya wisdom seems to have been first articulated by the Buddha in the Vajra Pranyaparamita Sutra. So it's in the Vajra Sutra that the Buddha gives the teaching about the illusory nature of the self, individuality, sentient beingness, and even life. Now, I'm not going to dive into the whole Dharma talk tonight. I can't because this is about kind of trying to summarize this sutra in a timely fashion. But I will mention this about what that teaching is about. That teaching from the Vajra Sutra, the Vajra Sutra actually has one pretty simple message. That one simple message, which is regarding emptiness, but this message as, as it's presented in that sutra is that characteristics, the characteristics of things, like all their characteristics, their size, their shape, their color, their number, everything about something, everything, all the qualities and characteristics that you would use to describe it, those are all illusory. Those are all empty. And the teaching, the very, the very simple teaching that I've been giving, and I've been trying to stick with this one throughout this sutra to kind of use it as a go-to place, but what we've talked about is starting with the characteristic of size and the idea that we might have that this one of the one of the many characteristics, but one of the characteristics of this is its size. The idea that it's a little cup. And the idea about that is that 
compared to this cup, this is little. And then we would say this is then the big cup. And what I've been using is then this other cup to say, wait, I thought this was a big cup. This looks like a big cup. And this is, this is relativity. This is what Einstein called relativity. This is something that actually everybody knows. Everybody knows this except confusion, moha, the delusion. We think the characteristics of things are in the thing rather than a dependently originated concept in the mind of the beholder, so to speak. N not out here, it's an idea. And so we can't say that this is little. We can't really say that it's big either. In fact, what the Bodhisattva realizes, what Pranya wisdom is all about, is that this doesn't have a size. Its size will always only be relative, but will never be inherent. Now, if you can understand that, if you can actually understand how this is neither big nor little, that it actually doesn't have an inherent size, you can also understand how it doesn't have an inherent color. And that, you know, is this the light one or is this the dark one? This is the light one, right? This is the light colored one, right? Oh no, this is the dark one. So color also relative and therefore not inherent. Shape also. Use also relative. And what the Vajra Sutra ultimately says is that all characteristics are not inherent and are therefore an illusion. It's an illusion that this is a little light colored cup. <laughs> Although it sure looks like a little light colored cup. What the Vajra Sutra then uh, does is it takes this same exact pranya wisdom regarding the emptiness of characteristics, it takes it to a really interesting conclusion, which is the characteristic of being alive. The characteristic of being a person. The characteristic of sentience. The characteristic of being a self. It speaks about even those actually being characteristics that are imputed, superimposed onto emptiness, onto nothing. They are completely mirage-like is the teaching. So that is the teaching of the Vajra Sutra. It's the teaching of Pranya wisdom, that phenomena are empty and they're appearance as they are is actually illusory, mirage-like. So that's ultimately Manjushri's sort of, well, his answers to the Bodhisattva lion courage, thundering voice, his answers are from a place of pranya wisdom, where there is no one to attain anything. That's where Manjushri is coming from in that way. Okay, everybody, uh, questions, comments, answers about that? Please feel free. We have plenty of time. But hopefully that just, we just got it. So, <laughs> all right. So then, after a couple of back and forths, and I, I went into detail about all of this, of course, in classes prior, but the questions that our, our uh, student bodhisattva, Lion Courage, the questions that he has for Manjushri are interestingly, um, they're, they're interesting because he, 
he asked first a question about how long until the Manjushri becomes enlightened. And when he kind of gets this Zen, kind of Zen koan answer of there isn't anybody to attain anything, and so there will never be an attainment of awakening, the Bodhisattva then tries to figure out, well, how long ago did you become a Bodhisattva? And he gets basically a very similar Vajra Pranya-esque answer to that as well. And then these questions ultimately turn into, because the, the, the Bodhisattva, the student Bodhisattva is kind of getting frustrated with Manjushri kind of avoiding answering all these questions. So the Bodhisattva appeals to the Buddha and says, Buddha, Manjushri won't answer these questions about when he became a Bodhisattva. Will you tell us? And this is an interesting way. It's a very interesting way for Manjushri within the context of the sutra to remain consistent in not speaking from a place of ego, from not speaking from a place of, oh, well, I, uh, you know, I made the Bodhisattva vow two weeks ago or whatever it is. So the Buddha speaks on behalf of Manjushri. And it's from the Buddha that we hear about Manjushri's origin story. So that's the next kind of movement in the sutra. It's about King Akasha. So Akasha is this uh, Sanskrit word that means space. I've also done Dharma talks about space. We don't mean outer space or black void of space. Space is always this kind of interesting dimension of the space between things, but not the things themselves, but the space. Manjushri in his answers to the Bodhisattva is often likening enlightenment and all these things to space. The nature of the self is described as being space-like. The nature of awakening is described as being space-like. And so it's funny or interesting that the Buddha tells this story that it took place zillions of years ago in another world in that sense, where there was a king named Space, Akasha, and this king has just been practicing virtuous things for kulpas and kulpas and kulpas. And the story that the Buddha tells is that this king amassed this giant um, store of merit. So not a store of jewels, not a store of wealth, but he had performed so many virtuous acts that he had amassed this store of merit. And as he knows he's getting ready to pass away, he has a question. And his question is, what should I use all of this merit for? And it's a lot of merit, by the way. It's you know not just a little, but a lot. And so he starts thinking, maybe I should dedicate or transfer all of this merit to becoming a god, to becoming like Chakra Indra, the, like the god of desire. And as he's thinking about this, about using all of this merit to make sure that in his next life, he gets reborn as a god. He hears a voice from the sky that tells him, why don't you transfer it to all sentient beings? Just give it away to all sentient beings. And it's a really interesting kind of story in that way, because Manjushri, or I should say, King Akasha, is really kind of amazed that the voice in the sky 
addressed him by his name, like knew his name. And so there's a way in which he, he agrees like, okay, I'll do that. But it's because he's like kind of blown away that he's heard this voice telling him to do this. But nonetheless, this king then makes this transfer, this great transference of merit to the enlightenment of all sentient beings. And it is at that moment that the king, Akasha, has made the bodhisattva vow, has made this vow to basically work entirely for the benefit and welfare of all beings. That's the bodhisattva vow. That king made the vow. And then what the Buddha tells us is, and, and do you know who King Akasha was? It was none other than Manjushri Bodhisattva. And that King Akasha, upon making the Bodhisattva vow, in a very interesting turn of events, the king predicts his own eventual enlightenment. Normally, it's a Buddha that gives the prediction of a Bodhisattva that they will someday become a fully awakened Buddha. Interestingly, a Manjushri's King Akasha makes this prediction of themselves. And I'll mention or I'll remind you that the Chinese version of this sutra is actually called the prediction of Manjushri's enlightenment, not the arrays of virtues of the pure land, but more about this interesting moment of the prediction of their awakening. Okay, so that's kind of this interesting moment. If you're reading the whole sutra, like kind of in one pass, this is also an interesting moment where the sutra, it's like everything starts out so simple. We're in India, <laughs> we're in Rajgriha. And then when the bodhisattvas start coming from these other worlds, things start to kind of get a little weird. And then when we hear this interesting backstory of Manjushri from kalpas and kalpas and kalpas ago, there's a way in which at that moment, meaning at this moment in the sutra, there's a way in which we don't know where we are. We don't know like what, what kalpa is it? What world system is this? And I feel like my, my feeling about this is that this is the sutra drawing you more and more into its world and more and more out of your conventional world of whatever is going on in the news kind of an idea. Then in that state, meaning where we have heard about, ah, and I did want to mention this, I don't want to lose the opportunity. In, these in this uh, section of the sutra where we're hearing about the past life of this King Akasha, but then we are also hearing about these like, we're, we're hearing about Manjushri's Buddha land that doesn't exist yet because he's not fully awakened yet, but he's already told the Bodhisattva that that's never gonna happen. And so, I, in other words, the sutra, it, well, I'll, I'm going to share with you a book really quickly, a totally other book. There's a great book called Once Upon a Future Time by Jan Natier. Awesome. She's a great scholar. I'm often mentioning Jan Natier, but she wrote this interesting book about it's kind of about sutras like this. And this is a great title. Once Upon a Future Time. It, it speaks to what's going on in this sutra where like Manjushri's Buddha land, it's like only once everybody's enlightened will Manjushri become a Buddha and have a purified Buddha land. So that hasn't, happened yet but they keep talking about it as if it kind of has already happened 
or maybe it's, again, maybe it's happening in that way. So I just want you to know that I'm not the only person that thinks these sutras are attempting or maybe even succeeding in operating in a in like an interesting grammatical structure a grammatical structure that is not exactly past tense not exactly future tense not exactly present progressive it's a a, a different tense that kind of includes all those in a way it, it kind of reminds me anyways i, I don't want to but it's a very interesting thing that's going on so it's in the context of that that then manjushri tells the buddha and it's upon the buddha's approval where he's like you can go ahead and tell everybody about this manjushri explains his the 10 bodhisattva vows that he has made and they all concern this idea of of liberating and enlightening all sentient beings and basically not achieving this fully enlightened realm until all sentient beings are awakened. There's a lot more to it, a lot more details to these 10 vows. I do want you to know that among the genre of Pure Land Buddhist sutras, and there's a bunch of these sutras that are Pure Land sutras where bodhisattvas come from different worlds and all of that. It's pretty common in those sutras that the main character gives their list of vows. So like there's a very famous, um, you, you may have heard of the Medicine Buddha by Shadja, by Shadja Guru Buddha. So the Medicine Buddha named by Shadja has a Pure Land Sutra and in that Pure Land Sutra, the Medicine Buddha gives a list of, I forget exactly how many are in that sutra, might be eight, can't remember though, but it's a certain list of vows. And then if you read the Pure Land Sutra of Amitabha Buddha, you will hear about the Bodhisattva that became Amitabha Buddha and the vows of that Bodhisattva. And I think that Bodhisattva maybe has 48 vows in that sutra. I think it's a longer list. My point is, this is a trope where you get a Pure Land Sutra about a specific Bodhisattva or Buddha, and you hear about the vows that they made in a prior life upon, you know, the, about their achieving of enlightenment. And I always like to mention to people that there are many, many of these sutras, and they all have these lists of vows. And they're not all the same. And I say this because I know that there is a, a codified list of bodhisattva vows that like the Mahayana world right now at large sort of uses a very standardized codified list of vows. And they're all very similar. They have a very similar tone regarding loving kindness and compassion for all sentient beings and things of, of that nature. But my point is, is that there are all these different lists of vows. And I think that they should be read like in context and not sort of extracted as a list to follow or like a list to obey verbatim because they're more poetic than that. And so if you go back and read the 10 vows of Manjushri, I would definitely suggest thinking and reading them that way. All right, so we're pretty much at the end, just a couple of last remarks about the last few movements. After we hear about Manjushri's 10 vows that will all kind of culminate in the purification of Manjushri's Buddha land, after that, we get an interesting little mini section where the Buddha starts telling us about Manjushri's purified Buddha land. And again, this is a kind of a thing where 
he's talking about it as if it already exists, but it hasn't happened yet. And basically the Buddha gives this description about a different Buddha land. And again, this is where the sutra is sort of like, whoa, where are we? But he describes another Buddha land and all of its arrays of virtues. This is the Buddha land of the Buddha called king of an ocean of virtue. And the Buddha basically describes that Buddha land and not only describes it, the Buddha performs another miracle where he reveals that Buddha land. And everybody that's on Mount Gridrakuta in the Saha world with the Buddha, they can all see miraculously this other Buddha land that's adorned with arrays of virtues of this other Buddha. And they're all kind of blown away by this miracle of seeing this other purified Buddha land that looks exactly like Manjushri's Buddha land will look. And then the kind of second to last part of the sutra is a really beautiful section. It's kind of one of my favorite sections. And it's a Dharma door. So it's a Dharma prayaya, a Dharma door. So a Dharma teaching on the single characteristic. So it's called the single characteristic Dharma door. And it's a, a very short chapter of, I think if I remember correctly, 14 or so bodhisattvas that all give their own understanding of what is called the single characteristic. The single characteristic of all dharmas or all phenomena for the sake of this Dharma talk tonight, for the sake of what we've been talking about, that single characteristic is that all phenomena is illusory. That is the one characteristic that all phenomena share is that they actually don't have characteristics and are empty. But that's a very subtle teaching that, again, I'm not gonna go into details, but it's a fun chapter because you get these 14 different bodhisattvas with their understanding of how to describe the single characteristic in that way. Um, yeah, and I think I, I will. I'm gonna read just really quickly one of those single characteristics because I think it's important for this Dharma talk. So I'm now gonna jump over to paragraph one point. 289, if you're interested at any point. And this Bodhisattva tells us the Bodhisattva Viraja added to the conversation. The Dharma teaching on the single characteristic expresses that which is totally free from attachment. In it, there is neither attachment to characteristics nor an absence of attachment. There is no attachment, anger, or delusion. There is no oneness and no non dual or and no duality so there is no oneness or duality no doing no not doing no accepting no rejecting so that kind of idea that gets kind of summarized in this one bodhisattva statement in particular this idea of that within this teaching of emptiness, within this teaching of the single characteristic, there is in that way, nothing to be attached to. There, because all things being illusory, there is nothing there to grasp at. And therefore there's nothing to let go of. 
In fact, there's no oneness or duality, as it says. And so this sort of teaching of emptiness, which is put in this way, regarding this sort of, there's no oneness, no duality, nothing to be attached to, and all of that, it's sort of it speaks more to the teaching of equanimity, of sameness, this idea of everything sort of being on an equal level playing field, and that equal level, level playing field is emptiness. And so in that, this idea of there not being anything to be attached to. I wanted to read that just because it kind of echoes the teaching from the very beginning of the sutra. And it kind of shows how the whole sutra is coming full circle to the ideas that were presented in the beginning. Okay, so that sort of the chap, that beautiful little chapter on the single characteristic is sort of the more or less the last teaching. We then have a last section, which is about sort of, again, um, the... Well, I would describe it as the inconceivability of Manjushri's Buddha land. It's ultimately kind of what the sutra gets to. It's ultimately what that last section gets to. And it's this idea that, and, and it happens because the Buddha is comparing Manjushri's uh, purified Buddha land to all these other Buddha lands. And he ultimately basically says that the very nature of Manjushri's Buddha land is so profound that it's actually ultimately inconceivable. And the way you could kind of think about that is the idea that, well, it's kind of what I've been trying to get to. As the sutra plays its kind of grammatical magic on us, and we're moved into a situation where we don't exactly know where or when Manjushri's Buddha land is going to happen. Like, did it already happen? Is it going to happen? It, it, the sutra moves Manjushri's Buddha land outside of the realm of conceivability. That you, it's, you can't conceive of it. If you, if you think it's in the past, you don't understand Manjushri's Buddha land. If you think it's going to be in the future, you definitely don't understand Manjushri's Buddha land. And so that kind of um, idea gets explained again with this language of inconceivable, the inconceivable nature of Manjushri's Buddha land. And that brings me back to the very last statement that I started with this evening. So at the very end of the sutra, and now I'm back to the Chinese, by the way, because this section where Manjushri enters the samadhi at the end, the samadhi emitting light of all bodhisattvas, revealing the illusory nature of all dharmas, it's not in the Tibetan version. Interesting. This is, I love scholarship for this. I love being working with multiple texts because you find these little bits that are not in the other versions. So I've got to read it from the Chinese translation. Then Manjushri immediately entered the samadhi of the bodhisattvas emitting lights to reveal all, dharma, all dharmas are illusory. After he entered this samadhi, he caused the assembly to see all the Buddhas in all the incalculable Buddha lands in all 10 directions. And in each of those Buddha lands, a Manjushri relating the merits and magnificence of his Buddha land in the presence of each of those Buddhas. After the assembly had seen this, they all believed the sublime great vows of Manjushri to be extraordinary. And when the Buddha had explained this sutra, 
the bodhisattvas, the monks, the nuns, the laymen, laywomen, devas, nagas, yakshas, gandharavas, asuras, garudas, kinaras, maharagas, humans and non-humans all rejoiced at the Buddha's teaching, accepting it with faith, and they began to practice it with veneration. And that concludes the sutra. But I did want to mention a very interesting, funny little thing. That last interesting little part about everybody seeing all these different Buddha lands. And in each of those Buddha lands, a Manjushri explaining the merits and arrays of virtues of his Buddha land. And I can't, when I ever I hear that, 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 happens in a few sutras where they talk about this idea of the same event taking place in multiple places at once. I can't help but be struck by the fact that this video will go up on YouTube and in each and every household in which it appears, there will be a Michael and a Manjushri explaining the virtues of Manjushri's Buddha land. <laughs> so uh, amazing the multiverse that we live in so all right everybody that's gonna do it and that's gonna conclude this study this year-long study of the sutra this is gonna conclude the dharma doors for a little bit i'm gonna take a little break uh for two weeks because christmas and new year's day fall on sundays i'm gonna take a little breather and get the next sutra ready for next year so um, Noam, I turn it over to you or to anybody if they have questions, comments, answers, or ideas. Anyone have questions, comments, answers, ideas? Everyone is very, very excited. Oh, yay. Uh, what a wonderful year it's been, Michael. <laughs> what, a, what a wonderful <laughs> evening. Thank you so much for this teaching uh -huh. and for all your teaching. Um, it's beautiful. Yeah. Yay. Um,